Of course, being a great emperor, or at least think of himself as a great emperor, he has to have an arch. So we have the arch of Constantine. And this commemorates Constantine's victory at Milvian Bridge in 312. And we see a mix of styles and traditions here. Now what's really interesting is most of this is actually taken from the arches of Trajan, Hadrian, and Marcus Aurelius. And in fact, here we can see those colored sections and sculptures are taken from these three other arches. We know they're taken from these three other arches. So it says something that they're building a triumphal arch, but they don't have the artisans available to create pieces of sufficient skill. So they simply take them from other pieces, other pieces that at the time are maybe 100 years old or a little over 100, maybe 200 years old. They aren't that old. We're in the main city. That should tell you something about where this society is going and what's happening to the Romans at this point. So they're refashioning things. Oftentimes they would take the heads from specific figures and recut them with Constantine's head. We also see this. Uh, so here we have in the left an example of one of those heads. You notice the hunter's head in the left looks a little small. That's because it's been recut to look like Constantine, but it's actually uh, meant to be from, I believe, Trajan's arch. But more importantly, we have the distribution of largesse, uh, which we're seeing from the North Frieze. And this piece is done for Constantine's arch. This is not something coming from another arch. And what we see is very shallow, very basic relief. What's happening is Constantine is giving spoils of war and giving largesse or charity to the people. It's very frontal. It's somewhat majestic. He's elevated on this throne. But look at the figures. They're all identical. All the facial features are identical as long as you add or subtract facial hair. Their clothing is identical. It's as if they had a stencil and they were just kind of repeating it over and over and over again. The heads and hands are suddenly too big. So if we take this figure here, we see his head is quite large and his body is maybe four to five heads high, definitely too short. His hand in proportion is almost as big as his entire head. Very unusual. And the clothing, I mean, right here, you can see the clothing almost mirrored back and forth between these two figures. So it's very mechanical very repeated. It's meant to be easy to read, but we see again that those artists are not putting in the time and detail that they did earlier in the empire, which tells us that the empire is falling. And we know the empire is falling at this point from a historical perspective, but this sort of imagery, we've seen this from the Egyptians, we've seen this from the Greeks at the, well, not really from the Greeks at the end, that was a little different story. But we've seen this from other societies, the Mycenaeans at the very end. And we'll see this again as societies come and go, cultures and peoples come and go. They always go through the same cycle. Now we also have the Aula Palatina. And this is the capital of the Western Caesar. I believe the Western Caesar comes with tortilla chip strips on it instead of croutons. I'm not sure. And Constantine's dad ruled from this location. And he will build this structure. This is another basilica structure, a palace complex. And today it's very austere. There's a reason for it when we go inside. Today it's a church. Actually, many of these Roman buildings are converted. But, of course, in Roman times, this would have been covered in marble. We would have had stucco work, in other words, painted stone. We would have had mosaics and sculptures. It would have been quite ornate. But when it's transferred to Christianity, when the Christians take it over, 
they will strip out most of that and make it a more humble setting. The reason is they're trying to fit it to their own doctrine. It makes perfect sense. They're not trying to destroy artifacts. They're trying to recycle these sites and these forms and sometimes these materials. Uh, we have two levels of windows, although we don't have a clear story. The reason for two levels is they don't have the technology to create one giant level of windows. Even with that frame, that grid work that we see in the windows today, they don't have the ability to move all of that weight of the ceiling down the walls if you have giant windows. You need more wall there. And this very much anticipates that Christian basilica form which you see on the right because where Caesar once sat in that apse suddenly becomes the center of prayer. It suddenly becomes the sanctuary and that is where we're going to see the altar and everything going on with the Christian mass because it's the seat of power once again except in Christianity the altar becomes that symbol of power and the cross becomes that symbol of power rather than an emperor or a ruler. Now, you'll notice that I haven't dealt much with Christianity at this point, even though we're right towards the end of Rome. And there's a reason for that. I wanted to split this class so that we're dealing with the pagan aspects of Rome. In other words, the non-Christian aspects of Rome at once before really getting into early Christianity, which is a story in and of itself that has to be dealt with really independently of Rome and then in parallel to the very end of it. So in the next chapter, we'll get into the development of early Christianity and early Christian artwork.